Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. How do you want to be remembered? I mean, do you want to be remembered when you've gone? Or would you rather just simply put you somewhere and, and everyone forgot about you? And perhaps some of our politicians might feel a bit like that this week. It's not been a great, great week. And uh, there are times in our lives when something happens that defines us. Perhaps we think of prime ministers, we think of someone like Churchill and um, what defines him is the Second World War. Perhaps particularly the speeches he made around just before and just after the Battle of Britain. Never in the field of human conflict have so many owed so much to so few. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, other Prime Ministers, later Prime Ministers, will be remembered for, for other things. But everyone who, who goes into that kind of office I'm fairly sure has some kind of, of hope that they will make a mark and that they will be remembered. But it doesn't always happen. People get forgotten. People who think they're terribly important. People who think that the world will never forget them. There was a poet called uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley. Um, he was given the sort of acronym uh, or the, the sort of thought that he was mad, bad and dangerous to know. Um, he was a bit of a wild one. Um, but during his lifetime, um, there was a great revival in interest in the land of Egypt. And all the things that uh, were there, the, the pyramids, um, which are still there because we couldn't take them. Uh, but also many other things that were taken and brought back to this country, to France the Germany go all over the place. Um, and he had a, a bet with a friend of his that they could write a poem about some great Egyptian. And uh, he wrote this. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command Tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on those lifeless things. The hand that mocked him and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, you mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains around the decay of that colossal wreck. Boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Those who ruled Egypt were powerful, famous, well known throughout the known world, and yet they, like everyone else, were buried by the sands of time. but not Melchizedek. We don't know that much about him, but he is remembered. Abraham, the father of, of all the people of God, um, had been fighting the confederation of kings who had taken his nephew Lot captive. And on the way back from the great victory and the plunder, because that's what you did when you fought in those days, you took plunder took it home. He meets this man called Melchizedek. He's the king of the city of Salem, which is an ancient name from the city of Jerusalem, the place where Jerusalem now stands. And there he honours him and he gives him a tenth of all the plunder he'd taken. Now, it wasn't normal for a priest to be a king. In fact, God stopped the kings of Israel doing that. They could be the king or they could be the high priest. They couldn't be both. It was too much power in one person. But this man, Melchizedek, 
has all this power. And the meanings of his name are kingly meanings. Melchizedek meaning king of righteousness and king of Salem. Salem simply means peace. He's mysterious. He is mentioned in Psalm 110, for instance, there's a, a prophecy that God will bless someone and make him a priest in the order of Melchizedek. But, but he's mysterious. There's nothing said about his genealogy. Hebrews talks about him as a man without beginning and without end. No beginning of days or end of life. Spurgeon, preacher, says, we see but little of him. And yet we see nothing little in him. He's a mysterious figure. A bit like the kings of Egypt were back in the Persia, shall we say. But he meets with the ancestor of the people of God. And Abraham honours him. He is priest of the God Most High. Now what God do you think that is? Do you think it's one of the minor ones like Baal with his statues up in his temple? No, this is a man who is priest of the one true God. At a time when God has called Abraham out of Ur, well it's, it's called Mosul now, but it's, it's uh, seen better days now, but Ur of the Chaldeans, and he's brought him into the, the land that would be given to them. And Abraham's having to, to fight um, to take back his nephew Lot and he's coming back from this great victory and he meets this mysterious man and he bows down to him and he gives him tribute and now the writer to the Hebrews comes and says Jesus is our high priest not in the line of all the Levites of all the ones from the tribe of Levi not in the line of all the ones who become priests because they belong to a particular family. Here is one, Jesus, our high priest, is more like Melchizedek, this mysterious figure from time without beginning and without end. This one, who Hebrews says, is a facsimile, one who's been made similar to the Son of God. So who is he? Well, the truth is we don't know. <laughs> but the speculation is that actually life happened to Abraham at another time when he's told, Abraham is told that he's going to have a child and Sarah's in the other tent and she laughs because it's such a stupid thing to say that God himself has come down to meet with Abraham. God himself, perhaps in the person of Jesus, his son, has come, this mysterious one without beginning and without end. But whatever, Jesus is a high priest in this order. He, re he, be he becomes and he remains a high priest continuously. The Levitical priesthood had, had all sorts of problems because you can get good priests and bad priests. There were people who, who served God well and there were people who didn't serve God well at all. There were people who took things for themselves and cheated the people when they brought their sacrifices. There were people who did things that were wrong. There were people who didn't sacrifice for their own sin before sacrificing for the sin of the people. It was far from perfect. But Jesus comes as a perfect high priest, as a better high priest than all the people that have come before him. Oh, how the people depend on their rituals, on their religion, on their rules, on their practices. They depended on having a high priest who would do things right for them, that their sins could be covered, that their sins could be taken away, that they could be right with God. Right to the Hebrews tells us that we have a better high priest in Jesus, one who remains forever. And he tells us that because of that, we have a better hope. Hope. 
We all hope for different things, don't we? Do we get what we hope for? when we're young? We get excited when it becomes our birthday or when it's Christmas time. We hope for all kinds of things. I don't know about you, but I used to hope for all sorts of things. It was just completely ridiculous. Um, and as I grew up, um, I hope for things that in his mercy, God has made sure that I've never had. Like I always wanted the Lamborghini Kunta. I always wanted the Lamborghini Kunta. Well, that's until um, I grew up and matured a bit. And in my mature stage, I wanted an Audi RS6. And my wife said, she could see she's shaking her head. She told me I am never having one because, well, she wouldn't have me very long. I'd be bent for the telegraph pole somewhere between here and Market Bosworth. We hope sometimes for things that we'll never have. And we hope for things that we shouldn't have. But hope is a wonderful thing. Hope is a lovely thing. Hope is a thing that keeps us going when times get tough. And he tells us here in, in, the, in Hebrews, in um, verse 19 of chapter 7, he tells us that because we have a better high priest, because we have one who has no beginning and no end, because we have one who doesn't depend on, doesn't get it just because he's, he's part of a particular family, but one who is appointed by God, whom God has said he will make our high priest, that we have a better hope than the people who obey the rules and the regulations and who do their best in order to please God. The former regulation is set aside. No doubt through the years, the church has been particularly bad at trying to reintroduce rules and regulations in people's lives. There have been times in the last 2,000 years when the church has been very good at telling people what to do and how to do it and when to do it and how much the church needs to be paid in order for it to be done. The church has gone back to the Old Testament. But the former regulation, he says, is set aside and a new hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was set in motion by the oath of God, by the promise and the swearing of God. And it says in, in, in Psalm 110 is where it comes from, but it says here in Hebrews verse 21 of Psalm, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. And in fact, Psalm 110 goes on to say, in the order of Melchizedek. We have a, a better high priest and therefore a better hope. Do you ever try to do something? And you just can't do it, or you find it really hard. I have tried down to the years to lose weight. As you can tell, I'm a very skinny man. I've succeeded totally, but not. Um, I found it hard. And you know, it's not chocolate. I can resist chocolate all day, every day. I can even resist Ruth's cakes. And that's no comment on the quality of my cakes, the fact that I can resist them. But give me crisps or chips or bread and butter. The number of times I go into the kitchen to, to make a cup of tea and I think, ooh, a slice of bread and butter with it. <laughs> the time, there are times when we try our hardest not to do something. Try our hardest to give up something. Try our hardest to do our best. And perhaps for you, looking at you, for some of you, some of you certainly don't have the same issues that I have. Try your best, but you just can't do it. We live in hope that we can, but we know that we can't. And so it is we're drawing close to God. We tell ourselves that we will do better. We say to God, I'll do better next time. I won't do that again. And then it happens again and again. And it's different for each one of us. But we now have a better hope. Because our hope is not... In obeying the rules and regulations, our hope is in a person. Our hope is in someone who has been made our high priest. 
someone who gets involved on our behalf. What was the job of Aaron? the old high priest? It was to make a sacrifice and it was to allow us to draw close to God. And so it is with Jesus. The law can't do it. Obeying the Ten Commandments can't do it. The country, obeying the Ten Commandments, couldn't do it. A commentator called Newell said this, let all legalists mark this. The law made nothing perfect. The law made nothing perfect. Let all those who dream of the law as a rule of life, the law made nothing perfect. Because we just can't do it. We just can't keep it. From our earliest days, I'm probably being too personal here, but from our earliest days when we're told not to do something, we wonder, why do we like to do it? We wonder, why don't want they want me to do that? See a sign that says, no trespassing. Myself and my friend Russell used to treat that as a challenge. Do not enter. Why not? What's behind there? Don't come here. There was a dump just at the top of the village um, and it said, keep out, dangerous. We used to spend our summer holidays rooting about in there. We used to do, yeah, I was on. We used to get big tubes. I don't know where it came from, but they were wonderful. They were about this long and about this big and they were amazing because you could put them on your shoulder and your friend could put a fire on rocket in the baggage and you could fire on things. It was amazing. Told me got cold, obviously, and it wasn't quite so amazing then. But that's what happens with rules and regulations. But we don't have those anymore. We have someone who has sacrificed on our behalf, someone who calls us to come and follow him. I will tell you if it was me or Russell who said, Come on, we ought to do it, because it wouldn't look good for me. But we have a better hope. In him. Because he is the one who says, Come on, walk with me. So we have a better high priest, we have a better hope, and we have a better covenant. In verse 22, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. The new covenant. We talk about that sometimes as we share communion together, but Jesus talking about the new covenant in his blood. The old covenant depended on the people obeying the rules and the regulations. God says, if you will follow me, if you will do the, the things that I tell you to do, then I will bless you and I will give you a land in which to live. That was the old covenant. The new covenant says, I've forgiven your sins. I've made a sacrifice for your sins. I've cleansed you. I will cleanse you from your sin. And forget your wrongdoing if you simply trust me. Allow me to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Jesus lives forever. He has a permanent priesthood in it, and it says, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. He always lives to intercede for them. I am the person that I am today, at least the good bits, the bits that give glory to God. Because people prayed for me. People interceded for me. I know that my mum and dad prayed for me from the day I was born. And I think I've told you before that they said to God, you can have back for your service if you want. I know that a man whose life I went literally made hell my Sunday school teacher, Andrew McCartney, prayed for me and the other boys. Um, he also misbehaved, misbehaved in his class because his widow, Lena, told me years later that he had. That's why I am the person I am. And that's why you're the person you are. If you follow him, there are people who pray for you. There are people who Ask God to bless you, to let you get to know him. And among that number is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's what it says. It says 
He lives forever to intercede for you and for me. And so when we get things wrong, when we stray from the path, when, we don't, when we're not the people that God wants us to be and we don't do the things that God wants us to do, instead of pointing out the rules and saying, you need to do this and you need to do that, our Lord, who is our High Priest, speaks to the Father on our behalf. He intercedes for you and for me. We have a better hope and we have a better covenant. That is the covenant he makes with us. He is on our side. He is there for us. He will listen when we come. When you know you've got it wrong. It's sometimes quite hard to say this it, with the people we know. It's quite hard to come to someone and say, I'm sorry, I, I was wrong. Sometimes it's hard because we just don't want to admit it. Sometimes it's hard because we don't know what they'll say. But with Jesus, we always know what he will say. We always know that he will hear our prayer and he will intercede with the Father on our behalf. Jesus gives us an example of his intercession in Luke 22. He, he says, Simon, Simon's talking to Simon Peter. Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. This is when Jesus knows he's going to betray him. By saying, I never knew the man. Nothing to do with me. I have prayed for you. So we pray for you and for me. And so knowing that he, we have a better high priest, knowing that we have a better hope for the future because of him, and knowing that we have a better covenant, a better agreement with God because of him, what kind of attitude should we have to life? What kind of attitude should we have when, when we do things wrong, when we do fall away, when we do sin? The enemy tempts us, to walk, tempts us to walk away and feel a failure. Well, I don't think we can have much of a better attitude than Martin Luther when he writes this. I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ. Son of God, and where he is, there I shall be also. He is a perfect high priest who gives us a better hope, and who administers a better covenant than any rule and regulation, any religion, any form of sacrifices. He is our high priest forever.